is Rayleigh, and I'm really glad that you chose to join us today for our worship service. I think it is so cool that the fact that you are joining us online today means that our church is actually meeting all across the city right now. And I, it makes me think of the fact that my small group meets together every single Tuesday night at various houses across the city. And it's just another expression of the fact that our church isn't confined to just four walls, but we actually spread pretty widely across this whole city. And we get to join in for times of worship like this all together. So I'm really looking forward to this weekend and we actually have a guest speaker here that some of you might know. It's our previous lead pastor, Keith Taylor. So I'm really looking forward to this one. Let's jump in together. Well, hello everyone. It's so great to be here with you today. My name is Tim. I'm the Young Adults Pastor here. If this is your first time joining us today, just want to say a warm welcome to you. We're so glad you're here. We'd love to chat with you in the Welcome Center after and answer any questions you might have. And church family, I've got a super exciting announcement for you. And it has to do with this team that's standing right next to me. We're sending a missions team to Guatemala at the end of June. And this is our very first missions team since before COVID that we're sending out. Yeah, we're super excited to see what God is going to do through this. And we know that through missions trips like this that are more short term, we're going for about 10 days. We know that it's a blessing to the people that we're going to. And based off of our conversations with Impact Ministries, which is the organization that we're partnering with, we know that it's, it's a huge support to them. But we also know that it's a great investment in the lives of the youth and young adults that are going. And so I'd love to hear from a couple of you, what are you most excited about for this trip? Hi, guys. Um, my name is Katie. Um, I've wanted to go on a missions trip for literally like my whole life, ever since I knew what a missions trip was. So to have this opportunity is honestly just the most amazing thing for me. And I think I just have like so many like hopes and dreams and wishes for this trip, but I'm going to share with you guys some of the main ones. So first of all, I just really want to taste and see that the Lord is good, not just in my life on this missions trip, but also in the lives of the people that I get to meet and that I get to connect with. Um, another thing that I'm just so excited for and just so looking forward to is just seeing hunger and thirst for salvation and for Jesus and for the gospel. So I'm just so excited to see that. And I think I'm also just super ready to um, be doing um, street ministry and evangelizing because that's one of the really cool opportunities that we have that we get to do. And I think there's just something just so cool about being able to share the gospel and just share Jesus with maybe people who have never even heard Jesus' name before. Now, I do want to say, going into this mission trip as a short-term missions trip, we are not going into this trip with the mindset of, you know, changing the world and being the ones who save those souls for Jesus Christ. That's not what, that's not the posture that we're going into this um, with. Instead, we're going in with the posture of wanting to encounter Jesus, wanting to encounter Jesus in the, in the lives of others and also hopefully have people encounter Jesus in our lives through us and see what God is doing in our lives as well. So above all, we want to come into this mission trip with humble hands and an open heart and just ready to do the will of our Father. Well, good morning, everyone. My name is Claire, and I am so personally excited to go on this trip, uh, especially because a few years ago, I felt God call me to missions as a career, to be a missionary one day. And so this trip is my very first opportunity to go out and take a tangible, practical step towards um, that calling and 
in obedience to God. Um, and especially one of the things I'm very excited about is the children's ministries and how we'll be partnering with Impact to um, work with them in the programs that they already have in the schools and the churches for the children in Guatemala. Um, speaking of Impact Ministries, we're not only going for a one-time short-term mission, but we're going to seek out a longer-term relationship with Impact Ministries, and then hopefully in later years, send out more uh, short-term missions teams. Awesome. Thank you, Claire and Katie. Well, church family, each of these team members have invested a significant sum of their personal finances towards this trip, but they're also looking for your help. So we've got a fundraiser that's going to be happening out in the conference rooms and in the atrium as well. And uh, there's going to be some authentic Guatemalan cuisine. There's a silent auction in the conference rooms with some amazing items too. So be sure to stop by after the service. Church family, would you pray with me for this team? Father, thank you that your heart is for the nations to reach the nations as much as it is to reach each one of us to be with us here in this room. So I pray, God, would you bless this team? Would you bless each of these youth and young adults that are going, that we would be a blessing to the people that we're going to and to the local church in Guatemala? And we also pray, Lord, would you do something new? Do something new in the lives of these youth and young adults that they would encounter you in a profound way through this. So we lift up your name now. We turn our hearts to worship you in Jesus' name. Amen. Church family, would you stand with me? Psalm 63, we read these words. God... You are my God and I eagerly seek you. I thirst for you, my body faints for you in a land that is dry, desolate, and without water. So I gaze on you in the sanctuary to see your strength and your glory. My lips will glorify you because your faithful love is better than life. So I will bless you as long as I live. And at your name, I will lift my hands. Oh, church, let's come to worship our God.
gonna be on it. It's a narrow road, but the mercy's wide, cause you're good on your promise.
Let strongholds not be moved, let spirits not be silenced, and cower at His rule. When my God is for me, then what have I to fear? And I will not deny Him the glory that is His. Will heaven not prevail? nothing on heaven and heaven or on earth or under the earth that will ever deny you the glory that is yours to receive for it is that one word one word from you and you can change the atmosphere one word from you and you can change our situation oh God one word from you and you can change the perspective we have of our situation and so our whole lives are meant to be an offering to you to say, God, nothing will deny you the glory that is yours. And so, God, when we gather together to lift up your name, to worship you because you alone are worthy, God, would you receive our offering? And Lord, when we gather together to give of our tithes and our offerings, it's a part of that. It's a way for us, God, to say, I glorify you, I honor you. And Jesus, my prayer is, is that as that plate passes from one person to another today, that as every hand touches it, it would be a prayerful moment to say, God, I trust you. God, I honor you. God, I glorify you. God, I worship you. And I hold nothing back because nothing will deny you the glory that is yours. And Jesus, as we sing a new song, God, would it be a prayer that lingers within our church family for our desire is that your glory would fill this house. Amen. Let's continue to worship.
much more than anything to dwell within your house for all my days. Knowing you is everything, so I let go of lesser things. You alone are worthy of my praise. So stir in me a passion for your name. 
ever taken the time to be in his presence? To really, truly just let go of everything. To not be so concerned about what was or what lies ahead or what's coming next. But just to be so present in his presence and to pray this prayer. To be so focused with your gaze on him to say, oh God, would you come? we truly believe that it's only one word from him can change everything wouldn't we want to stand in his presence lean in and listen and say oh god would you come holy spirit come would you fall like rain May we always stand in awe and reverence of who you are, who are we, that we would be able to approach your throne, but yet you welcome us in and you meet us here. And you hear every cry. And you lean in and you meet with us. Oh God, would you open up our hearts would you open up our eyes? And God, as we open your word, I pray that you would speak to us in ways that we would know and that we would understand. And God, my prayer all weekend has been the same, that the way that we came in this room is not the way that we leave it. Because we spent time in your presence. And when we spend time in your presence, we just can't be the same afterwards. So Holy Spirit, come and have your way. We are open and receptive. Thank you, Jesus, for your presence in this place. And it's in your holy and precious name that we pray. Amen. Amen. You can grab a seat. Church family, I love when we get to do this together. I love being in the presence of God together and just seeing him move in our midst. And I've really been loving this new series that we're in called A Fresh Start. And this week we have a special guest speaker with us. He is our former lead pastor, Pastor Keith. Would you welcome him to the platform? <laughs> Sorry, that makes me laugh. <laughs> you set a high bar. Uh, some of you are new and say, who is that guy? Uh, man, it is it's great to be able to teach this weekend. Uh, Daniel and his wife are off at a marriage enrichment or marriage development uh, course they're teaching for elite uh, couples across Canada. They're gathering together, so it's a very important ministry. And, and so he asked if I would teach this weekend, and I was thrilled to be able to come back and be with people I love, and many of you I don't know yet. And uh, uh, again, so glad that you're a part of the Beulah congregation. I love seeing the room getting fuller every weekend as more and more people are coming to know Christ. And for those of you who are online, we're thrilled that you're with us and pray that God would speak to your hearts. We're in a series that's called uh, A Fresh Start. And Daniel launched it out with a talk on a, the story of Elijah and how Elijah faced criticism. And he made a fresh start of trust and dependency on God. And then Cam last week, great job of sharing about the story of David and Bathsheba and how the theme of repentance about beginning again, starting again when we've sinned greatly. And Daniel asked me if I could speak on the habit of hope 
in the times of, of seasons of great grief? How do we find a, a fresh start when we've experienced great reversals? And kind of looking at the story of Naomi in the book of Ruth in the Old Testament. If you've got your device, your Bible with you, I, I'd encourage you to turn back and, and uh, open your Bible and have the book of Ruth there. And it's, a, it's a great, great story. We're going to look at chapter one together of this. You know, I've got a few years under my belt. You probably can tell by my hairline and I've done some pastoral work for a number of decades. And I have to tell you that as the years went on, I became increasingly aware of the complexity of this life on this side of heaven. I've been up close with many of you have experienced uh, great grief at the death of a family member. I did a service this weekend where it was a husband and wife who had attended this church for, we figured it was 68 years. And they died five weeks apart, the husband and wife, in their 90s. And so we had a combined service. And it was just really amazing tracing the story of their lives. Walked along with many of you through the crushing loss of a pregnancy or perhaps just the grief of a broken heart. Our relationships ended suddenly. You didn't expect it. Maybe the pain of divorce, marital breakdown. For some, it's been the sudden loss of employment or the shattering of dreams. Really, the list is exhaustive. And I just think of, of how some of you who are here today are experiencing a, a season of, of great challenge, not one you chose, not one you expected. Maybe you're in the midst of it right now. You're swimming just to stay above water. Maybe you're in a season of such loss, you'd call it the, the dark night of the soul, you know. But I can say with certainty, Every one of us will have some losses coming our way. Jesus said, in this world, you will have tribulation. But here's an important truth. While we may strive for a meticulously outlined roadmap for our lives, all neatly ordered and placed, the reality is that we're going to encounter detours, unexpected turns, unforeseen challenges. Yet in the midst of losses, it's an act of faith in God that he is still at work in our lives, that God's still writing his story for you and for me, and that his ultimate aim is to bless us, that he has good for us. Now, when you look at the book of Ruth, it's fascinating as it opens. The story really shines a light in a sea of darkness. It just opens the book. It says it was the time of Judges. And if you know about the book of Judges, the theme of that book was everyone did that which was right in their own eyes. It was a time when people had turned their back away from God and there was consequence and God brought some judgment upon them. There was a famine in the land and Bethlehem, known as the house of bread, that's what the name means, Bethlehem, it wasn't a house of bread. It became a place of famine. And so a young family decides they need to go where there's food. They heard that on Moab, the next country over, there was food. Food, so they headed that way. It's just a short book, four chapters. But it starts right on launching into the story of this family escaping the famine, leaving their friends, family, that, that things that they knew for this foreign land. Look at the, the uh, uh, scripture here. I think it's verse four or verse three. Naomi's husband, Elimelech. I had a hard time with some of these biblical names. So I was practicing. I was sitting there going, Elimelech, Elimelech, Elimelech. And I thought... I'll never forget his name. Neither will you, now that's planted upon your mind. But it says, Elimelech, he dies, and he leaves her with two sons. The sons had taken Moabite women as their wives. One was named Orpah, and the second was named Ruth. They lived in Moab for about a decade, 10 years. Both Malon and Chilion also died. And the woman was left without her two children and without her husband. This is, we launch right into a grief story here. Elimelech leaves Naomi as a widow in a foreign land. She has no way to provide for herself in that agrarian culture. When a husband was gone, the provider, there was great consequence. This would be heartbreaking, crushing for her. Not only would she not have a way of, of making a living or supporting herself, but she has that incredible pain of losing not just her husband, not just one child, but two. I can't imagine. She's helpless. There's no social security to provide a social net. There's no life insurance policy to provide provision to fall back upon. What will she do? And in that culture, probably two options. One extreme was you'd be a beggar in poverty. The other would be likely you'd sell yourself to at least feed yourself. In Moab, it was a bleak future that would await her. Overwhelmed with grief, loneliness, fear. At her sense of hopelessness, I wonder if Naomi thought, why don't I just cash it in? Why don't I just, I might as well die. You ever felt that way? 
Things just piled on you. You felt lost at some level. It's not just one thing, but they just keep coming like it did for Naomi. You're hit with one and then you get hit. Just about the time you get your head above water, a wave comes over you. You think you're going to survive and then you feel you're going to drown. And you're not sure you're going to make it. This is the moment Naomi finds herself. Experts in grief management teach that the defining moment of loss is not the loss itself. It's our response to the loss. It's how we face the losses that come our way. You know, I, I would think back uh, in some of the experiences I had, I think of one moment years ago. It was a defining time for me as walking a couple through their premarital preparation. They were, I liked this couple. They just were adventuresome and they had an amazing story how they came together. They were madly in love and we got to the wedding day and did the wedding and it wasn't a matter of a couple of weeks. He called and he said, on the honeymoon, she was in incredible pain. We didn't know why. Went to the doctor. They've diagnosed her with stage four cancer and she's got months to live. They moved into his parents' house At the same time, they discovered his dad had a different kind of cancer and had also been given less than a year to live. He spent nine months married, walking his wife through palliative care to her death and his dad. His mom a widow, him a widower. He's like 22 or 23. It was pain on a stick. I remember sitting there as they were going through that dark night of the soul, of that loss, thinking, what will happen? What will they, what will, what will happen? And then watch the story begin to move. But one of the things that I discovered as I've watched many go through times of grief, in the midst of great loss, in the midst of great challenges, there are important choices to make. You haven't lost the capacity to choose. The first thing we see in Naomi's story is the choices we make. Our hope can be restored. Catch this. Our hope can be restored if we move in the direction of healing. The accepted wisdom of our time is that during times of great loss, is to delay decisions. There's some wisdom there. Grief can cloud your perceptions, your thought process. People who make abrupt decisions may regret them later. Many experts suggest wait a year before moving or changing jobs or (laughs) jumping into another relationship, the rebound. They say take time to heal. But you know, there are choices you have to make. Naomi could give in to her circumstance, but she looks around and she decides. She hears things are better back home, so she says, listen, I gotta go home. You ever notice sometimes in the midst of grief and heartache, loss or hopelessness, the hardest thing to do is to begin to make a choice to move in the direction of starting over, of saying, I don't know what's going to happen, but I'm going to move toward healing. Sometimes we're paralyzed by our need to hang on to the last remnants of what we've lost. Stuck in our pain, we feel immobilized. In our depression, we lack the energy, maybe even the will to do anything at all. So we want to give up. We want to rehearse our losses. We want to maybe just wallow in self-pity. But just a step is hard. A step in the direction of receiving again from God, of being blessed again from God, of moving toward him in that pain in our soul. Now, I'm not saying we should run away from our pain. No, no, no. I see Naomi actually took her pain with her back to Bethlehem. We're going to see that in the story. But she made an important decision. She decided to live and receive again from God. Catch that. She decided to live and receive again from God. And you and I need to do the same thing. It might be a decision just to get out of bed in the morning. Maybe that's... That in itself could be a big decision. You know, for others, it might be a decision to say, in my brokenness and my loss, I need to go see a Christian counselor and process this with someone. It might be the decision you made today to be in church, and you didn't feel like it this morning, but you just felt, I got to do this. I got to be with some people. And that was a good decision for you to be here in the company of people who care about you, who may direct you, even through worship, to look toward Jesus. Maybe it's a small group that many of you have found a little band of brothers and sisters that can help you process your pain. You know, it might even be a decision to say, Monday morning, I'm going to go and look for a job. But whatever it is, listen, God will give you the strength to make the choice that's in the direction of life. That's a wonderful promise. You know, I think about Daniel when he's speaking about Elijah. And God had done this incredible miracle and the whole, remember the just explosion that took place and all these God showed his power and his majesty. And you you turn the page and here's Elijah threatened by some two-bit queen. And it's as though Elijah thought maybe God had ran out of miracles. Maybe God had, you know, he had exhausted God's supply of provision. I don't know what was going on. 
But in your, in, your, in your sorrow sometimes, you just go, maybe I'm out of blessings. Friends, you're not. God loves you. He can be trusted. You know, speaking of choices, I find our culture, grief-laden people often make destructive choices. What kind of things do our world say to do with our grief, with our pain, our losses? Remember hearing that great theologian, Garth Brooks? When he sang that song, and I'd sing it for you, but you would rather I didn't. He sang, I've got some friends, where? Oh, you've heard that song. I'm sorry to hear that. I was listening to the lyrics one day, and I thought, you know, people hum that song. It's kind of catchy. He says, I've got some friends in low places where the whiskey drowns and the beer chases the blues away. He says, and I'll, what's the next line? I'll be okay. No, you won't. This is bad advice. Probably not. I mean, this is, this is how you, you just try to deaden the pain, avoid the pain, maybe just somehow just try to stuff the pain, but the reality is the pain is still there. You just add another set of complexities and often bad decisions. Too many wind up in the ditches of alcoholism, broken relationships. Unresolved grief might show itself in compulsive eating or spending. You begin to act out through your pain. It's an inability to recover and rebuild your life having experienced a devastating loss. If we don't face our losses, if we don't process them well, work through them, the results can be devastating. I was talking to a young gal who was sharing with me about how in her life she said she'd heard a speaker make a comment that, that oftentimes if you don't process your grief well, if you don't actually deal with your losses, you, in, your, in your angst, in your anger, in, the, in that bottled up emotion, you can make some bad choices. And she said, I realized, the speaker said, that many people actually, if they trace back their lives, how they made a season of really bad choices, ran away from God, got involved in all kinds of messy stuff, had an affair, did something crazy. They said, if I traced it back, behind that was an unresolved hurt. An unprocessed loss. And in their, in their frustration, they moved in a way that led them to greater brokenness. And then God in his faithfulness led them back to themselves. And they actually went back and dealt with that loss. Sometimes we don't deal with our losses for a long time. But I want you to catch something, friends. If we don't face our losses, process them well, work through them, it can be devastating. Healthy grieving can lead to healthy living. Unhealthy grieving can just simply make a mess out of life. Naomi decided to take a step towards life. She heads over the mountain back to her hometown, Bethlehem of Judea. Her two daughters are in tow, Orpah and Ruth. Orpah, interesting name. Sounds like a, sounds like a, a whale, Orpah. Here's a Bible trivia. What, what major media star was named after Orpah? You know who it is? Oprah. Yeah, Oprah. On her birth, birth certificate, she says in her book that it was actually Orpah. And that people got her name wrong so often, it just stuck. And so whenever you see her, you can think of the book of Ruth, okay? I don't know why you would, but that's the background of that, that one. I don't know why I told you that. You don't need to know that. Forget that, okay. <laughs> These three women have a bond together through their shared loss. Their shared suffering that's, that's knit their hearts together. And that often happens to us, doesn't it? You ever been with somebody that just journeyed through what you've journeyed through? All three have lost a partner. Maybe Garth Brooks got that part right that we need some friends. The second way to move toward hope, I think, is the company we keep. Hope can be restored through a loyal commitment to each other. Picture with me the three women walking down the road, and I imagine Naomi's thinking about getting back and reestablishing herself and what it's going to look like. And as she's walking along, she looks over her shoulder, and, and she, sees, she sees Ruth and, and Orpah, and she's thinking, what's going to happen with them? And she goes, hang on, they're, they're Moabites. And Moabites weren't welcome in Israel. They were a foreign people. They weren't even allowed to come into worship. And so they're, they're widows. They're foreigners. I mean, what kind of promises are going to be for them in Bethlehem? And she's reminiscing or, or ruminating upon this. And she turns to them and she says to them, hey, look, you've got to go back. You've got to go back. Don't come with me. And she's wrestling with the reality of what's going to happen and, and 
There's no one to protect them, no one to provide for them. So in, in verse 8, she says, go back to your mother's home. May the Lord show kindness on you as you have shown to the dead and to me, she says. May the Lord grant each of you rest in the house of a new husband. You, you may remarry and, and, and start again. And look, notice their love. It says they wept loudly. Common suffering really bonds your heart to somebody. In genuine concern, she says, may God show kindness. And the Hebrew word is, is the word hesed, out of that word. It's the idea of loyalty or kindness. May God show compassion on you. May he show his steadfast love for you. She loves them. She wants the best for them. Go back, start over. But in spite of her request, Ruth and Orpah refuse to go back to the mother's home. And Naomi shakes her head and, and she kind of amps this up. And she goes, have I got any more sons for you to marry that could become your husband? And then she gets a little sarcastic, I think. She goes, hey, even if I got married and I conceived tonight, would you wait until they grew up and you could marry them? <laughs> if I chance. Go back. Well, she makes her point. Orpah buys it. She heads home, but Ruth doesn't buy it. Ruth, I mean, she's a noble woman. And her words to Naomi at this moment, I think, are some of those beautiful words penned in Scripture. You probably heard these words in a wedding ceremony or maybe you've heard them as a blessing but it's the expression of faithful, loyal love between these two women. Ruth looks at her mother-in-law and she says, you should say these to your mother-in-law, all you got, people are married, okay, to your mother. Don't plead with me to abandon you or to return and not follow you. For wherever you go, I will go. Wherever you live, I will live. Your people will be my people and your God will be my God. Where you die, I will die. And there I'll be married or be buried. It's interesting when she says, Your God be my God, literally in Hebrew, it's your God, my God. <laughs> she says, Ruth, I'm leaving what's behind and I'm going with you. I'm gonna embrace your God, I'm gonna embrace your people, I'm gonna embrace your destiny. Matter of fact, in their culture, to say, I will be buried with you. There was a notion that if you were buried with someone, you'd actually spend eternity with them. She's saying, Ruth, she's a Naomi, I'm with you forever. And when I read this, it's like she's saying, Naomi, someone will take care of you, and that someone will be me. Do you see it? She's making a break with her past. She had learned about God from Naomi. I thought, well, where did she learn about God? Well, watching Naomi, you say, well, hang on. I, with all she'd been through, wouldn't you say, I don't want that God. I mean, that, that's a difficult God. But she had seen her, the faithfulness of God, the confidence that Naomi had deeply had in him. And Ruth had been through some hard shots too. She lost her husband. She'd probably gone 10 years without bearing a child. But she expresses unusual faith and loyalty. What was Naomi's response to this? <laughs> when I was studying this passage, it jumped out at me in the next verse. It says, Naomi didn't talk to her. And they kept walking. And I could just see Ruth walking behind Naomi thinking, I, I'm, I'm committed, I'm devoted, I'm gonna be there for her. And I can see Naomi looking back, she's still there. She's still there, she's still there. Reminds me of the story of a fellow that had lost his wife and it happened suddenly and he was just devastated. And he told the story later, he said, you know, my neighbor came alongside and provided some meals and was there. And he said, one night, he says, after the service, and we'd had a memorial, he goes, I was just broken. He says, I began to walk. And he said, I lived near a river, and I began to walk the trails by the river, kind of like we have in Edmonton. He says, I was walking along, but I looked over my sh shoulder, and there was my neighbor following me. He wasn't walking behind me or beside me. He was walking behind me, and all night long, he just stayed a little distance, but he stayed there. And he said, as the sun began to rise up over the horizon, he looked at me, and he said, Let's go get some breakfast. My neighbor and I went, we had breakfast, and he said, my neighbor was there for me for the weeks that were there ahead. And he said, I go to my neighbor's church now. Because he says, if a guy could love me through that, th that season of great pain in my life and be there through that darkness, he says, I want to worship that kind of God. Yeah. Are you really to walk alongside of somebody? I think this is, this, is, this is so profound because Naomi would find hope through Ruth's stubborn love. Naomi would find hope through Ruth's stubborn love. If you think about how we grieve in our culture, often the line is when you have a setback, you go through pain, suffering, sadness, loss. We can have the propensity like Naomi to pull away from others, build a wall around ourselves, keep people at a distance. We don't want anybody to see us when we're in deep pain. But you know, friends, God never intended for you to go through life on your own. He didn't intend for you to go through grief or tragedy, loss, difficulty by yourself. He made us for each other. 
He wired human beings to need each other. We are better together. If we're going to survive seasons of loss and tragedy, we need loyal, committed friends to have this kind of hesed, this kind of stubborn love, to look out for others beyond ourselves. And who more than us here, brothers and sisters in Christ, should make a choice to cling to each other as Ruth clings to Naomi. Well, we read of their arrival in verse 19. Small town, probably only 100, 200 people live in Bethlehem at that time. The buzz around town is, hey, have you heard Naomi's coming back? Uh, you're serious. And it's interesting how scripture says it. Here's what they whisper. Is this Naomi? You go, that's a question, not a statement. Why? I think when people looked at her face, that alone would have told what she'd been through. You ever been with somebody, you look at them, you go, wow, they've been through a lot. She lost her husband, her two sons, now returning with nothing but a foreigner in tow, a Moabite woman. And here's Naomi. What's the first thing that she says when they ask a question? Naomi is huge. She looks at them and says, don't call me Naomi. Call me Mara. For the Almighty has made me very bitter. I went away full, but the Lord brought me back empty. Why do you call me Naomi? The Lord has opposed me. The Almighty has afflicted me. The word Naomi actually means the pleasant one. The word or the name Mara means bitter. It says, just call me bitter. It's kind of like meeting somebody in the coffee area after church and they said, yeah, how are you doing? Just call me miserable. I think I've met some people sometimes like that. Just call me bitter. Now you might feel Naomi was very unspiritual or unfaithful to talk this way. But she really tells it honestly how she feels. And I don't think she's the first person who lodged a complaint against God. You read the Bible, Jeremiah, Job, Moses, David, all expressed their lament to God. I think God might actually appreciate their honesty. Well, we need to be in the right company for our hope to be restored, devoted friendship. But let me share a third one. That is the concerns you express. Our hope can be restored by honestly lamenting our loss. We live in a world that says, bury your feelings. When there's loss, I think God's approach is the exact opposite. I think God says, don't bury your feelings. Don't novocaine the pain. No, no, feel your feelings and express them. Don't deny, don't discount. Don't put on a face of bravery. I grew up in a home where we were kind of Welsh background, and I think our theme was keep a stiff upper lip. Didn't share tears easily. But grief is a healthy process. You've had a major setback. Tell God exactly how you feel. Don't tell him what you should feel. Don't tell him what would be right to feel. Just lay it out there. Because when there's loss in your life, you're probably going to experience some emotion. One of them will be anger. Why is this happening? You'll probably have grief, that weightiness. Oh, why this? Oh, you'll have shock. I can't believe this is happening. You'll probably have questions. Why, God? Why? You'll have fear. What do I do now? I think Naomi felt all of those things. But you need to express those emotions to God. Don't hold them in. Don't say, God, I'm happy about it, you know. The Bible says that, that we're to trust God, not that he'll take us out of our circumstances, but he'll take us through our circumstances. As we go through our circumstances, we can say to God, I'm fearful, I'm frustrated, I'm scared. God, this is hard. You say, well, how can God handle that? We gave you emotions. He's an emotional God. I see Jesus, the son of God, when he lost his friend Lazarus, what did Jesus do? He could have fixed it. He could have said, hey, guys, just don't worry about it. I'll get this all put back together. He felt the loss of human pain. It says Jesus wept. The son of God felt things deeply. You see it before the cross as he felt the great pressure of those moments. Friends, we have an emotional God, and I think God is not offended by your questions and complaints. When you're close with someone, you share all your feelings, and you can share them with God. You know, our, our choice to lament and face the pain, as Naomi does, I think is necessary, where we actually will experience healing through our pain. Think of the psalmist King David, great majestic guy. What does he do? He wrote a bunch of psalms of lament. He goes in in, uh, Psalm 31, Be merciful to me, Lord. I am in distress. My eyes grow weak and sorrowful. My soul, my body with grief. My life is consumed by anguish and my years by groaning. You know that? Isn't that a good word, groaning? You ever been in a situation where you groan? You just go, oh, this is hard. 
my strength fails by my affliction, my bones grow weak. I thought, man, he is very articulate in his pain. But if you get to the end of the chapter, he comes back with a prayerful response. But I trust in you, Lord. You're my God. My times are in your hands. So he laments, but then he hangs on to faith again. But you're God. I will trust you. When I was a pastor in a particular season of time, there were a number of losses that just came cascading one after another after another. And I I think maybe there was some scripting I had picked up along the way was I would just get through it and I think I've got a certain amount of emotional resolve and I was plowing through these things and some of them were very, very sad and very difficult and it culminated with the death of an eight-year-old. And I was doing, what we walked the family through it. It was a skiing accident. Someone had ran into her. It was tragic. And my wife and I were there at the hospital when the doctor said, we'd recommend you unplug life support. We were with the couple at that moment. It just broke my heart. But, you know, at the moment, I was, I was strong because I thought, you've got to be strong. Did the service, and I thought, I've got to be strong. And it was hard. I got back to my office, and I was sitting there, and I thought, what's happening to me? That I could go through this, and there's just, there's no emotion. And then I realized that, that the, the cultural message of, you know, keep a stiff upper lip, be strong, don't share a tear, that was beginning to be my mantra. And I felt like the Holy Spirit was saying to me, if you won't feel the lows, you'll eventually not feel the highs. The goal of life is not just to numb out all your feelings, but to feel your feelings. And I thought I advised the congregation to lament, but I hadn't lamented. So I sat there in my study and I began to lament. I said, oh God, this, this sucks. <laughs> I think that was the word he used. This is painful. And as I began to just use words about that experience of walking that couple through it, all of a sudden the dam broke and I wept like a little kid. I, I thought that verse that says, God keeps our tears in a bottle. I needed a mason jar that day <laughs> to get my tears out. Jesus wept. Look at Joseph, the great leader in the book of e- in the, the, the uh, early uh, Egypt and great leader, and it says, I think like 15 times it says Joseph wept. Tears can be cleansing. Are, are you feeling your pain sometimes? To just lament it and walk through it and just say, it's okay for me to cry because it's sad. But it's also okay to move on. And it's even okay to talk honestly with God because I look at Naomi as she complains to God. The Almighty has dealt very bitterly with me. The Lord has brought me back empty. What she had a hard time seeing was not that God was involved in her life. She believed he was sovereign. But what she couldn't see was that he would work all, things, all those things together for good and for her blessing. Is there any way God could take this pain and redeem it and use it for good? Could he begin to work all things together for good and take that which was so hard and begin to bring something good and gracious about it, even to bring glory to his name? Friends, the hand of the Lord wasn't really against her, although it may have seemed that way. The truth is that God loved her, that God was working for his, her greater blessing. God hadn't finished writing her story. And this is what Naomi would have to learn. God was still at work. Verse 22, the chapter ends, it says, So Naomi returned, and Ruth the Moabite, her daughter-in-law, with her from the country of Moab. I thought, it's an interesting way to end the chapter. They got back from Moab with her daughter-in-law. They came to Bethlehem. It was the beginning of the barley harvest. You go. I often thought, this chapter should be resolved better. But this barley harvest is actually one of those teasers you see on Netflix about the next series. And and you see in chapter 2 and 3 and 4 how the barley harvest begins to move something in God's provision and leading and the working in Ruth's life. And you see the story continue because God's not done yet. I want to close with three reminders that would help us to find the habit of hope that helps us in a fresh start that could give perspective in the midst of sorrow. First, Reminder is this, God is always with you even though your pain may obscure your vision of him. Look at Naomi, she's going like, what's God up to here? I went with full hands, I came back with empty hands. It feels like he's against me. In our pain, our pain obscures our vision of him. Jesus said, I have told you these things that you may have peace. You will have suffering in this world, but be courageous. I have conquered the world, Jesus said. There's a day coming when Jesus is going to make all things right. 
On this side of heaven, we live in a sin-sick, fallen world where there's going to be sufferings and difficulties. And matter of fact, Peter said, we may even share in the sufferings of Christ. So don't be surprised at the fiery trial you're going through. But there's going to come a day when we're going to see the Lord face to face. And when we get to heaven, it's going to be perfect. There's going to be no more sorrow, no more sickness, no more death, no more deceit, no more garbage going on. It's going to be a new day. And so, as Paul said, we have hope. And because we have hope, we do not grieve as those without hope because we have hope of what God's going to do one day. Friends, in your pain, it may obscure your vision of him, but God is still at work. Society's approaches bury your feelings. Just simply replace the loss. Grieve alone. But God's approach, I think, is to feel your feelings. Review your loss. Grieve in community with others. Society says time will heal, but God's approach is that the Holy Spirit will heal. He's called the comforter. He's the one we go to. The word actually means he'll come alongside of us. Friends, think of this, that God's peace, his presence can be there in suffering. And I've watched again and again and again over the decades where people at the dark night of the soul reach out to God and say, God, help. I'm in so much pain. And as I talk to them after, they say, Pastor, you won't believe it. I just... I felt God's presence like I've never felt in my life. He met me in a way I just, it was like he was there. One gal said this. She said, I felt like I was just, I was weeping and like like Jesus had just put his hand on my shoulder and was weeping beside me. God is there for you. Secondly, remember that it's not by our strength alone, but that God is the strength of our heart and our portion forever. Jesus said, blessed are they who mourn for they'll be comforted. God invites you into his loving arms so he can heal our wounded hearts. God gives us the desire for comfort, but we've got to reach out and accept it. Through prayer, leaning into his promises, sharing our deepest feelings with him, we can find a place in his presence where he does wrap his arms around us like a father consoling a child. The third reminder is this. Remember that God sees the whole picture when we can only see a part when that mother and son lost their loved ones, you go, how will they make it through? With God's grace and strength and peace and the company of others and the fellowship of the, of the, of the church family who walked with them, saw them rebuild their lives. And eventually, over the few years, he met another gal, got married, had a couple kids, and, and, and there was a depth and a quality and a maturity there that I think came through suffering. And watch how God blessed a mom and how he provided and led and she had a ministry of encouragement and and blessing for others and I just they 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 were refined by suffering not a curriculum we choose but often it's the curriculum we receive where God shapes us don't be surprised when you go through sufferings God won't waste your pain he's still writing your story You can't see it from here. You don't know what twists and turns he's got written. There'll be things that you couldn't even imagine that God has in store for you if you'll trust him and stay close to him and abide in him. If we open our eyes and wipe the tears away and look around us, maybe we can say, maybe there's a blessing in this. Maybe I have something I didn't even know I had. You know, I I think about Ruth. She's got Naomi, this devoted (laughs) devoted daughter-in-law who blesses her significantly. We see God beginning to write the story of Ruth's life in the next chapter of this book. And you find that God brings a husband for her. And it's, it's really a God story. It's remarkable. I wish I had time to go through it. But here's the greatest thing is she has a child. And so turn the clock forward about 12 months and Naomi has resumed her name again. She's listed as Naomi. Her friends say, oh, you're blessed like you had seven sons having Ruth, this devoted daughter-in-law. But here's the cool part. She's holding this step-grandchild and she's bouncing this little one. It says she became the nanny for for Ruth's little one. And who would that little child be but the great-grandfather of King David? And you would find that that would trace right through to the lineage of Jesus. Out of Naomi's hardship came Jesus. And out of your hardship, he may show himself as well. Will you trust him? Don't lose hope. Scripture says God can work all things together for good. He can weave the narratives together of your life. Although today may seem overwhelming, the storm is raging. Choose to move towards life. Make wise decisions. Lean into community, for he cares for you. Lean into his arms. Share your feelings deeply and openly with God and trust him that he's not finished writing your story. And he wants to bless you. He's not out of blessings. 
Would you bow with me in prayer? I, I just believe online in a room this size, there's someone who's here today who said, oh, he's been reading my mail. <laughs> I, I feel really overwhelmed with a whole bunch of things in my life right now. And you've really felt helpless. You wonder why God's letting this happen and you're trying to make sense of it all. Why not come to him and just say, Jesus, I need your comfort. I need your strength and your courage. Maybe today you need to get in a quiet place and just share your heart with God and tell him how you really feel. But then ask him for his help. Ask the Holy Spirit to give you guidance and wisdom as you make choices and you move toward healing and wholeness. Jesus, I pray that you'd speak hope into the heart of someone today who feels really hopeless. I pray, Holy Spirit, you'd provide comfort to one who feels very alone and overwhelmed and not sure what the future will hold. I pray that you would provide a healing balm over their heart that would provide that, just that embrace to say, this is hard, but I'm with you and I'll see you through it. And Lord, I pray we could lift our eyes to believe that you could redeem these things and you'll work them for good. We'll trust you in this, Lord. We pray in your name. We give you glory and praise because you're faithful for now and forever. Thank you, Lord. Amen. Amen. Well, thank you, Pastor Keith, for sharing that word with us. What resonated with me the most was the choices amid the loss to lean into community and to honestly lament. So thank you for sharing that. Can we give a big thank you to Pastor Keith? Mm -hmm. Well, church family, I just want to remind you that we've got our missions team fundraiser with our youth and young adults that are going to Guatemala at the end of June. And there's going to be a Taste of Guatemala booth there with some awesome food as well as a silent auction in the conference rooms too. So be sure to stop by. Thanks, everyone. Have a great week. What an amazing time worshiping and hearing the word. It is so good to be able to feel the presence of God together. Earlier before the service, I mentioned that I'm in a small group that meets every single Tuesday across the city. And if a community like this is something that you're interested in, I'd really encourage you to go to Beulah.Family and hit the Join a Community button. And you'll find a list of all the different communities throughout our various campuses that meet within the city. And maybe there isn't one that fits your schedule, but we encourage you, you can also start a group with some friends and have that be one of the communities that meets within our church family. Again, thank you so much for joining us. We'll see you next week, either online or in person at any of our campuses.